Greetings, brothers. Yeah, apologies in advance. Um, no iPad today, so I'm on the phone. <laughs> right, I'm just going to pray quickly. <coughs> to the only wise God who belongs power, dominion, power, and glory. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. May no words glory in your presence. No, may, f- no, may no flesh glory in your presence, but Christ crucified. We ask this in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Amen. <coughs> it's a pleasure to be here before you, brothers, today. Um, I was supposed to speak at the last rooted, but uh, my father-in-law passed away at the time, so I was unable, wasn't in a place to speak. But Nathan's given me another opportunity uh, to speak to you. And so we're going to go straight in because I know we're already pressed for time. (coughs) And today I'm going to be talking to you about the reliability of the scriptures. The reliability of the scriptures. If you've got pen and paper, this might be a good time to get ready to jot some stuff down. So Matthew 25 verse 35 says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Isaiah 40 verse 8 says the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. 2 Timothy 3.16 says all scripture is breathed out by God and is acceptable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. That is the self-proclamation that the Bible gives of itself. That it is the eternal word, the everlasting word, the word that does not perish. It does not fade, it does not wither. It is eternal, everlasting, never fading. The words of the only wise God. This is what it proclaims of itself. This is this internal proclamation of itself that it is the word of God. It doesn't ask you to believe that it is the word of God. It assumes that you know it's the word of God. And so in turn, we as believers, we talk up this volume that we treasure. We claim that this is the word of God. You can see see people standing in the street saying that this is the word of God. See, in nature, we have a revelation of God to a certain degree that there is creation. But the Bible gives us a greater revelation of who God is, who, what his character is, what his attributes are. But more than that, we get the revelation from Genesis to the book of Revelation of Jesus Christ. From beginning to end is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And without the Bible, we do not have this revelation. And so we hold this Bible near, we cling to it. Our lives spouts, for, spouts life from the word of God. It is, our, it is our truth. It is what we cling to. It's why the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, that is able to make you wise unto salvation in Jesus Christ. It holds in truth. It is weighty. But it must be said, brothers, that we live in an age that is full of misconceptions, full of ignorance, and full of, you know, twisting what scripture says in order to fit a particular agenda. Or maybe not even just twisting, but just outright denying it. Denying its truth, denying its validity. Denying it as a historical document. Denying the existence of Jesus and that the Bible is just a bunch of fairy tales. You may have heard that before. I get all the time, oh, it's just a bunch of fairy tales. Why are you believing in that, man? You need to look at a higher power, all this kind of stuff. You know, you know how it is. You know how it is. You already know. There are certain claims that are made about the Bible, and a lot of the time, they don't have any validity. They're just things that are picked out of the air. And because we live in a generation where social media is everywhere, even in this room right now, yeah, it's, you, you can't escape it. And we know that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And there is an influence within the social media, within TV, radio, podcasts. Compared to about 20 years ago, the accessibility that people have to information, whether truthful or fake news, is is everywhere. It's everywhere. And I just want to show you an example of the influence that is in the culture today. Unfortunately, the projector is not working, so I'm going to have to play you the clip from my phone. 
<laughs> no, it isn't. Um, can we run the video? Just to give you background before you press the video, um, this is a program called The West Wing. It's not very good. Um, <laughs> but it's a political US drama. And in the scene you're about to see, uh, this person who is, I don't know if he's vice president or one of them power hungry people, basically. He sees someone in the audience who presents a radio station and then he just basically begins to grill her. But if you run the track, run the video, please. Run the track. Sound engineer. <laughs> but you can see clearly that there is an agenda there. Not only was he taking the passages out of context, uh, some of them he quoted from the wrong passage of scripture, anyway. But this is the world that we live in. The Bible is, is made to look like a bunch of fairy tales that has all these ridiculous things in it. And a lot of the time it's misconceptions, things that are taken out of context. And even when you try to say, oh, context, they're like, oh. Because they have an agenda. They will always try to put scripture in a particular light to create controversy. And, and they'll do it unhonestly. They won't do it honestly at all, dishonestly. And this is the age that we've been born in. But this is no coincidence, no coincidence at all. So we have to be prepared and equipped to deal with things like this. Because it's easy for us to just come to church, you know, clap hands, do the thing on the Sunday, you know, check how people are for five minutes and then bounce home to Sunday dinner, and then it's Monday again. And that's the last time you read your Bible, Sunday. Let's be real. Let's be real. So what I want to do with you in this moment is just look at how the Bible was put together, to give you some information into how the Bible came into formation, and then to look at its reliability as a historical document. Is that okay? Okay. So you may have, ever, you may have wondered, or you may have heard people say, oh, all the books in the Bible aren't there. There's these mysterious ones here and there, and all this kind of stuff. That would be a type of question aimed at the canon of scripture. Anyone heard the term canon of scripture before? Okay, so yeah, this would be uh, a question of the canon of scripture, and it comes from the Greek word meaning read or measurement. So it's a, it's a rule or a standard. Yeah, the canon then is a collection of authoritative and inspired scripture. And so different religions will have different canons of scripture. And our canon of scripture is broken up into 66 books. Can anyone tell me the division between New Testament and Old Testament? what the numbers are. How many books in the Old Testament? There's a prize for whoever gets it right. Oh dear. I'll give you a clue. Old Testament is 39, yeah? If you want a little piece of facts there, if you break that number into individual digits, three plus nine times nine, you get the answer for the New Testament. Who said that? 27. Okay, cool. Come see me after. <laughs> Guys, that is shocking. <laughs> 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament. Yeah, it's written in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. It was written on three different continents, Asia, Africa, Europe, and written by 40 authors over 1,600 years. That is harmony. Our Roman Catholic friends made an edition in 1546 called the Apocrypha. Anyone heard of that? Yeah, the Apocrypha. And within that, they have uh, the book of Tobit, Judith, 1 and 2 Maccabees, the wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes, and Baruch. Now, I'm assuming that everyone here is from a Protestant background, so we don't hold the Apocrypha as authoritative and inspired, and there are various reasons because of that. We don't have time to go through all of those, but what I encourage you to do is when you go back to your home churches, to speak to your pastors, your elders, your youth leaders, your men's leaders, and ask them for a session, ask them for information as your first point of call. And then if you need to go and get resources, do that. It's very interesting stuff, and it's stuff that we should not be ignorant of. So let's look at the Old Testament. How did the people of God start to get and collect written words of God? 
We might think that the first was the book of Genesis because it's at the beginning. But the first collection of written words were on two stone, two stone tablets in Exodus 32 where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. And it, and it says there that he wrote, him, he wrote the Ten Commandments with his own hand. And it reminds us that these, although we have these words that were written by man, they are God's words. He is the author of these words. Whether it was him doing the Ten Commandments or working through individuals to inspire them to write down words as instructed, they are his words. Amen? And then we see in different times that God tells Moses to write in a book. And then we see Joshua following Moses, writing in the book. And the Old Testament is added. You've got Samuel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, all writing. And others in Israel added to the Old Testament. And it began to grow as a collection of God's word. And then at the end of the Old Testament, there's this pause for 400 years. There's no more, thus saith the Lord of hosts. There's no more, Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Silence for 400 years. 400 years, imagine. No word of God. And then that segues us into the New Testament nicely because the silence is pierced in a certain wilderness in Judea by a certain man called John the Baptist. And he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And that brings us nicely into the New Testament. Now the formation of the New Testament began early within church history. By the second century we had a good collection of the 22, 22 books of the New Testament at this time was recognized as inspired and apostolic. And by the end of the third century, the 27 books were all recognized as inspired and authoritative. And, and at that point, the canon was closed. The canon of scripture was closed. There was no more additions. There were people coming with false documents and forgeries and all this kind of stuff. But by the fourth century, the canon of scripture was closed. So from the fourth century, this book has not been altered. There hasn't been any additions or redactions or anything like, this is what we have from early, early, early church history. Listen to this, uh, listen to this quote. One thing must be emphatically stated, the New Testament books did not become authoritative for the church because they were formally included in a canonical list. On the contrary, the church included them in her canon because she already regarded them as divinely inspired, recognizing their innate worth and generally apostolic authority, direct or indirect. The first ecclesiastical councils to classify the canonical books were both held in North Africa at Hippo Regis in 393 and Carthage in 397. But what these councils did was not to impose something new upon the Christian communities, but to codify what was already the general practice of these communities. That's a quote from F.F. F. Bruce and his book, The New Testament Documents, Are They Reliable? Go and get that. The person who got the question right, I'm going to give that to you. So that is very, very briefly, very, very broadly, how we got our canon of scripture, how it came into formation. Again, I say, like, just go and research it yourself. We have an embarrassment of resources available to us and access points to go through. So do that. <coughs> so now that we've had a look at how the Bible came into formation, we're going to look at why it's a reliable piece of antiquity. So let's look, at, let's look at what makes this document reliable and trustworthy, because we've all heard the accusations. Oh, we know that the Bible has been changed by men many, many times, so you can't really tell if, the, if what you have is actually what was said, and you don't even have the original manuscripts, so how can you actually tell that it's, what is said is actually true? Now you've got to ask yourself, I don't know, in this room, if someone came and said that to you, what would you say? What would you say? Remember, this, this, this is the thing that you're pinging your life on, basically, because it tells you about Jesus. Without it, you don't know who Christ is. So you're pinging your very existence, how you live in light of it, on this book. And if someone comes with you at that question and says, you know, it's not reliable, you can't just say, you know, oh, you just got to have faith, man. Just have faith. 
Faith comes into it, don't get me wrong. But we have to be able to respond and say, look, this is the evidence. Whether you believe the evidence or not, it's there. It's certified. <coughs> and when it comes to the testing of ancient literature to test its reliability, there's a few different tests. And when the Bible is run through these tests, it's not even a contest. It's, it's like putting, I don't know, Anthony Joshua versus, I don't know, Amir Khan. I mean, I'm just saying, innit? We know what's going to happen. It's not even a contest. Let's, let's not pretend. It's not a contest. And, and how we look at to see if the copies are right, basically, what, it's, it's like if I gave five, five people in this room an essay of how much I hate Tottenham Hotspur, right? And then I've told you to copy it, but then I've told you to go and tell the next five people to copy the essay so on and so on and so forth. When we get to a certain point in the generation of that copy in where there's 4,000 copies. Now, at some point, someone's going to make an error. You might get a spelling mistake wrong, or you might turn the phrase a little bit because of your writing style, or you might have misread. But how we'd be able to compare is if we got all the copies together, and at a certain point, that first five people that I gave the essay to, we're going to see that someone has a mistake that the other four don't have and we'll be able to redact back to imagine what the original copy was like. And that's what it's like with the Bible. It is an extremely reliable piece of historical documentation. So I'll give you some numbers. So everyone know who Plato is? Plato, yeah? Seven manuscripts for Plato. The, the, the gap between Plato the copy of, of the manuscript that we have and the originals is 1,300 years, okay? Remember that figure. The New Testament, 5,000 Greek manuscripts and 25,000 copies. And the gap between the copies and the original is within the lifetime of eyewitnesses. So it's very reliable. It's not even a contest, like I said. Plato, 1,300 years. It's the same with Aristotle's Poetics. We've got five manuscripts for that. And no one's saying that this is an unreliable piece of historical documentation. But the Bible, because there's an agenda, you give people these numbers and they're just like, yeah. Try to explain it away, but the facts are there. That's what you call reliability. That's the New Testament. What about the Old Testament? OK. Uh, anyone heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Dead Sea Scrolls, you might have heard of that in games as well, like Assassin's Creed and all that kind of stuff. <coughs> the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1946 at Qumran, and the texts that were found there were 1,000, they were predated 1,000 years before certain manuscripts that we had that we were looking at and verifying this is, this is what the Bible said. So this Dead Sea Scroll was 1,000 years before and was virtually identical. 1,000 years, no alterations, no changes, no removing of certain passages of scripture. I think there was, a, there was 17 changes in Isaiah 53. 10 of those were misspelled words. Three of them was like a different word for light in Hebrew. But these are not big changes. These are not something that's going to change the whole passage and the meaning of the scripture. So again, the texts are reliable. We have a reliable historical document before us that we can say to people, look, this is number one. This is number one. And brothers, I just want to say this is the tip of the iceberg to the information that is out there, because I know I'm pressed for time. It's the tip of the iceberg, so I'm just encouraging you to go out and to look at these things. They're there. There's books, there's CDs, there's podcasts, and I'm on for sharing, so I'm going to give you some resources. And there's a website called CARM, C-A-R-M, Christian Apologetics Research Ministry. That's a good one. There's another one called CRI, which is a Christian Research Institute. Um, there's also a sermon that I want you to, to watch. If you have time, just go on YouTube and type in the name Bodhi Barkham. You may have heard of the name before. There's a, a, a sermon there called Why, Should I, Why Do I Believe in the Bible? And it's based on 2 Peter 1, 16 to 20, which I'm just going to read quickly, which says, 
For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honour and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, the prophetic word to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Say amen to the reading of God's word. In this sermon, he creates a phrase based on this passage that I've memorized in 2007. So I was at, uni- I was at university, 2007, was that 10 years ago. <laughs> and he says that he believes the Bible, he chooses to believe in the Bible because it's a reliable historical document written by eyewitnesses in the lifetime of other eyewitnesses. These eyewitnesses report to us supernatural events that occur in line with specific prophecies and claim that their writings are divine rather than human in origin. And that's his quote. Go and watch that sermon, you'll get more information. And again, I'm just encouraging you brothers, we're in a perilous time. And if we don't know this, we're in trouble. (coughs) So yeah, I'm just saying, just embrace, embrace the word of God, study it, be inside of it read it day and night, meditate on it day and night, over and over in your mind so that it solidifies in you and it manifests in what you do. It's not just something that you know, it's something that you live in light of. Thanks for having me.